Napoleon Hill, who was then from New York City, gave a speech in Salem College to a graduating class. It was about 10 miles from his home where his wife lived. He had left that town about 10 years earlier to make his way in Chicago. His family thought he was crazy for going because he left a high paying job. He wanted to make it on his own. So he went to Chicago and he fell. He fell several times. By the time he came back for this address, he had become successful. And uh, he wanted to talk about his failures and explain to his family what he had learned from those. And he gave a remarkable speech like anything that I've read by him before. And I therefore pressed Christina for the opportunity to deliver it today. And these words came from him and they haven't been spoken in over 85 years. He starts off in his words that there is a legend as old as the human race that tells us about a pot of gold that you can find at the end of the rainbow. This fairy tale, which grips the imagination of the child's mind, may have something to do with the fact that there are young people today uh, are seeking an easy way to find riches. For more than 20 years, I sought the end of my rainbow that I might claim that pot of gold. My struggle in search of the evasive rainbow's end was ceaseless. It carried me up the mountainside of failure and down the hillsides of despair. It lured me on in search of the phantom pot of gold. I was sitting before a fire one night discussing the old, with the older people the question of unrest among the part of the laboring men. One of the men who sat before me at that far side made a comment which proved to be one of the best pieces of advice that I ever heard. He reached over, firmly grasped me on his shoulders, and looked me in the eyes, and he said, why? You are a bright boy. If you will give yourself an education, you will make your mark in this world. Largely as a result of this remark, I enrolled in the local business college, a step which I admit proved to be one of the most helpful things I ever did, because it gave me a fleeting glimpse of what one might call a fair sense of proportion. That is, the idea of performing more and better service than being paid for. After completing business college, I obtained a position as a stenographer and bookkeeper and worked in that capacity for many years, several years. And as a result of performing more service and better service than being paid for, which I learned in business college, I advanced rapidly and I always succeeded in filling positions of responsibility. Far in advance of my years with salary proportionate, I saved money and soon had a bank account amounting to several thousand dollars. I was rapidly advancing toward my rainbow's end. I could see the rainbow end. I was in demand not because of what I knew, which was little enough, but because of my willingness to make the best use of what I did know. The tides of fate blew me southward, and I became sales manager for a large lumber manufacturing company. I knew nothing about lumber, and I knew nothing about sales management, but I had learned that it was well to render better service and more of it than I was being paid for. And with this principle as my guiding spirit, I tackled the job with the determination to find out all I could about selling lumber. I made a good record. My salary was increased twice during the first year, and my bank account grew bigger and bigger. I did so well in managing the sales of my employer's lumber that he organized a new company and took me into partnership with him. I could see myself growing nearer and nearer to Rainbow's End. Money and success poured in to me from every direction all of which fixed my attention steadfastly on that pot of gold that I could plainly see just ahead of me. Up to this time, it did not occur to me that success would consist of anything but gold or money. But fate was awaiting me just around the bend, and I did not see it coming until it was too late. Like a stroke of lightning out of the clear blue sky, an economic collapse and the panic of 1907 crashed down upon me, and overnight it swept away every dollar that I had. The man with whom I was in business withdrew, panic-stricken, without loss, and left me with nothing but the empty shell of a company that had nothing going for it except a good reputation. So it took an economic collapse and a failure which it brought to divert me from my re and redirect my efforts from the lumber business to the study of law. Nothing on, nothing on earth but failure, or what I then call failure, could have brought about that change. Thus, a turning point in my life was ushered in on the wings of failure. There is a great lesson in every failure, whether we know it or not. When I entered law school, it was with the firm belief that I would emerge doubly prepared to end up with a rainbow and claim my pot of gold. 
I still had no higher aspiration than of accumulating money, yet the very thought that I worshipped most seemed to be the most elusive thing on earth because it was always evading me. It was always in sight, but it was always just out of reach. I attended law school at night and worked as an automobile salesman during the day. My sales experience in the lumber business was turned to good advantage. I prospered rapidly, doing so well from the habit of performing more and better service than paid for, that the opportunity came to open a school to train an ordinary machinist in the automobile assembly and repair. The school prospered until it was paying me a large monthly salary. Again, I had the rainbow's end in sight. Again, I knew that I had found my niche in the world's work. Again, I knew that nothing could swerve me from my course or cause me to divert my attention. My banker saw me prospering. He extended me credit for expansion. He encouraged me to invest in outside lines of business. He appeared to me to be the most finest man in the world. He loaned me many thousands of dollars on my signature about collateral. My banker loaned me money until I was hopelessly in debt, and then he took over my business. <laughs> it all happened so suddenly that it dazed me. I didn't think such a thing was possible. You see, I had still much to learn about the ways of men, especially the kind of men that unfortunately my banker turned out to be. From a man of affairs earning a good income, owner of a half dozen automobiles, and much other junk that I didn't need, I was reduced to poverty again. The Rainbow's End disappeared and it was many years before this failure was, before I learned that this failure was one of the greatest blessings that had ever been bestowed upon me. Because it forced me out of business, which in no way helped me develop the human side, and diverted my efforts into a channel that brought me an experience that I greatly needed. I went back to Washington, D.C. a few years after the event, and to my surprise, I found the bank had gone out of business, and my erstwhile banker had been reduced to poverty. I wondered for the first time in my life if one might find another thing at the end of that rainbow, something other than money. Because I was my wife's husband and her family had influence, I next secured an appointment as an assistant to the chief counsel of the family-owned business. My salary was greatly out of proportion to the wages that the company usually paid beginners, and still further out of proportion to what I was worth, but it was pull, but pull is pull, and I was there because I was there. It turned out that what I lacked in legal ability, I supplied through that one sound fundamental principle that I had learned in business college, namely to render more service and better service than paid for, whenever possible. I was holding my position without difficulty. I practically had a birth for life if I cared to keep it. One day I did what my close personal friends and relatives said was a very foolish thing. I quit my job abruptly. I quit that job because I found the work was too easy and demanded too little effort on my part, and I found myself drifting from day to day. This move proved to be the next important turning point in my life. Although it, is, it was followed by 10 years of effort which brought almost every grief that the human heart could experience. I quit my job in the legal field where I was getting along well, living among good, good friends and relatives of what they believed to be a bright and promising future, and I moved to Chicago. In Chicago, I secured a position as advertising manager. I knew next to nothing about advertising, but my previous experience as a salesman came to my rescue. And my good old friend, the habit of performing more services and better services than being paid for gave me fair balance on the ledger sheet. The first year I prospered. I was coming back by leaps and bounds. Gradually the rainbow began to circle around me once again and I saw once more that shining pot of gold almost within reach. I believe it is important to recall that fact that my standard of success had always been measured in terms of dollars and my rainbow's end proved promised nothing but a pot of gold. I did well as an advertising management. The president of the company was attracted by my work and later helped me organize the Betsy Ross Candy Company. And I became its president, thus beginning, beginning the next and most important turning point of my life and a prelude to another failure. This business began to expand until we had a chain of stores in many different cities. Again, I saw my rainbow's end almost within reach. I knew that I had at last found my business in which I wanted to remain for life. Everything went smoothly for a while, until my business associate conceived the notion to gain control of my interest without paying for it. 
the plan worked. But I resisted more stiffly than anticipated, and he had me arrest, arrested on false charges, but offered to settle it out of court if I would turn over my interest in the company. I refused and insisted on going to trial. But when the time came for court, no one was present to prosecute me. The judge, the Honorable Arnold Heap, stopped proceedings and threw the case out of court because it had gone very far, before it had gone very far, with the statement that this was one of the most flagrant cases of attempted coercion that he had ever come before seen. To protect my reputation, I brought suit for $50,000 in damages. The case was filed five years later, and I secured a heavy judgment in the Superior Court of Chicago. But I suspect that another and more exacting law was operating during those five years. Because the man who originated the scheme to have me arrested was already serving a term in a federal penitentiary before my action came against him to, for trial on a charge. My judgment stands as silence evidence and vindication of my character. It is also evidence of something far more important than vindication, namely that the unseen hand which guides the destiny of all of us who earnestly seek truth had eliminated from my nature all desire for a pound of flesh. My judgment against my accusers was not collected, and it never will be. At least I will never collect it, because I suspect it has been paid many times over in blood and remorse and regret and failure visited upon those who had attempted to destroy my character for personal gain. This is one of the greatest single blessings that ever came to me, because it taught me to forgive. It also taught me that the law of compensation is always everywhere in operation with and that whatsoever a man soweth, so shall he reap. It blotted out of my nature the last lingering thought of seeking personal revenge at any time and under any circumstances. It taught me that the time is the friend of all who are right and the mortal enemy of all who are unjust and destructive in their incidents, in their efforts. We now come to another venture which probably brought me nearer to Rainbow's End than any of the others. I turned my efforts toward teaching advertising and salesmanship. Some wise philosopher had said that we never learn much until we start trying to teach others. My experience as a teacher proved this to be true. My school prospered from the start. I had a resident school and a correspondence school to which I was teaching students in nearly every English-speaking country. My school was growing by leaps and bounds and I saw the end of my rainbow drawing nearer and nearer. I was so close that I could almost reach out and touch that pot of gold. But suddenly war came to the world and as the war came, it swept away my school, and I was again practically penniless. Again, I stood at the far, far end of my rainbow's end. A thought began to enter my consciousness and prompted me to ask, maybe if I had not been searching for... Maybe I had been searching for the wrong thing. I sat down to my typewriter with nothing particular in mind. To my astonishment, my hands began to play a regular symphony upon the keys of the typewriter. I had never written so rapidly or so easily before. When I was through, I had five pages of manuscript, and as near as I have been able to determine, that manuscript was written without any organized thoughts on my part. It was an editorial out of which my first magazine, Hill's Golden Rule, was born. I took this editorial to a wealthy man and read it to him. Before I had read the last line, he had promised to finance my magazine. All of my life, I had wanted to become a newspaper editor. More than 20 years ago, when I was a very small boy, I used to kick the press from my father, who published a small newspaper, and I grew to love the smell of printer's ink. The important thing is the fact that I had my proper niche in the world, and I entered into it strangely without any thought of finding a pot of gold. The magazine prospered. On the beginning, in less than six months, it was being read in every English-speaking of the world, the country of the world. It has brought me recognition from all parts of the world, which resulted in a public speaking tour in 1920, covering every large city in America. When I commenced to preach the Golden Rule in my first magazine, I learned to live it as near as I could. There is a big difference between believing in the Golden Rule and actually practicing it, a term which I learned when I began my first magazine, the truth uh, which uh, I learned when I began my first magazine. I was rapidly approaching my rainbow's end for the last time. Every avenue of failure seemed closed to me. My enemies had slowly been transferred into friends and I was making new friends by the thousands. But there was a final test to undergo. 
As I have stated, I was approaching the end of my rainbow with the firm belief that nothing on earth could stop me from attaining my pot of gold and everything else that a successful searcher for that great reward, reward might want. My first magazine, Hills Golden Room, was snatched out of my hand overnight. It was a savage blow to me, and I started to think that there was no truth to the Golden Rule at all. I had been preaching to thousands of people through the pages of my magazine, in which in person I was doing my best level to live as well. This was a supreme moment of test. I was so stunned that I had to stop and catch my breath. I had been preaching that one cannot steal another man's ideas or plans or goods and still prosper. My experience seemed to give the lie to all that I had ever written or spoken along this line because the man who stole the heart, the child of my heart and brain seemed to be prospering with it. Months passed. I had been disposed and my magazine had been taken away from me. I felt like someone who was undergoing a nightmare and cannot wake from it. My courage was gone. My faith in humanity was all but gone. My love for humanity was weakening. Slowly but surely I was reversing my opinion concerning the highest and best ideas of which I had been building for more than a score of years. The passing weeks seemed like an eternity. The days seemed like a whole lifetime. One day, the atmosphere began to clear. Time is a wonderful healer of wounds. Time cures everything that is sick or ignorant. Most of us are both at times. During the greatest failure of my life, this one, I was reduced to greater poverty than any that I had ever known, and it cut a deep, ugly wound in my heart. When I had all but given up, I stood face to face with one of the most trying tests that I ever came, ever experienced. The postman delivered my scant collections of mail one day, and as I opened it, I was watching the pale red sun as it had all but disappeared over the western horizon, and an envelope fell open, and as it did so, a certificate of deposit fell to the floor and fell face upward. It was for $25,000. For a whole minute, I stood with my eyes glued to that bit of paper, wondering if I were not dreaming. I picked it up and read the letter accompanying it. That money was mine. I could draw it out of the bank at will. However, there were strings attached to it, strings that made it necessary to obligate myself to turn my back on everything that I had been preaching to the world. The supreme moment of test had come to me. Would I accept that moment which provided ample capital with which to publish my new magazine, or would I return it and carry on a little longer? Then I heard the ringing of a bell in the region of my heart. It caused the blood to tingle through my body. With the ringing of the bell came the most direct command that ever registered itself in my mind. It was a positive, startling command and brought a message which I could not misunderstand. Without promise of any reward, it commanded me to return the $25,000 check. I hesitated. The bell kept ringing. My feet seemed glued to the spot, and I could not move out of my tracks, and the bell kept ringing. Then I reached my decision. I decided that I must heed that prompting which no one but a fool could have mistaken. The instant I made this decision, I looked, and in approaching twilight, I saw the rainbow's end. I had at last caught up with it. But I just saw no pot of gold. I found something more precious than all the gold in the world, as I heard a voice which reached me not through my ears, and not but through my heart, and it said, Standeth God within the shadow of every failure. The end of my rainbow brought me the triumph of principle over gold. It gave me a closer communion with the great unseen forces of this universe, a new determination to plant the seed of the golden rule philosophy, philosophy in the hearts of millions of other seekers who are looking for the end of the rainbow. Closely following my decision not to accept financial help from, unseen, from these sources that would control my pen, I got all the capital necessary to cover the cost and carry Napoleon Hill magazine over its beginning period. Now let me summarize the most important lessons which I learned in my search for Rainbow's End. First and foremost of all, in my search for the Rainbow's End, I found God in every concrete, understandable, and satisfying manifestation, which is quite significant if I had found nothing more. All my life I had been somewhat unsettled as to the exact nature of this unseen hand, which directs the affairs of the universe, but my failures on the rainbow's trail of life brought me at least to a conclusion which now satisfies me. Whether my conclusion is right or wrong is not much of importance. The main thing is that it satisfies me. 
The lessons of importance which I learned are these. I learned that those who we consider our enemies can become our friends. And that in the light of all that has happened, I would not go back and undo a single one of these trying experiences, because each one of them brought to me positive evidence of the soundness of the golden rule and the existence of the law of compensation through which we claim our rewards and for virtue and play, pay the penalties for our ignorance. I learned that time is the friend of all who base their thoughts and actions on truth and justice, and that it is a mortal enemy of all who fail to do so, even though the penalty of the reward is often slow in coming. I learned that the only pot of gold worth striving for is that which comes from the satisfaction of knowing that one's efforts are bringing happiness to others. One by one I have seen those who are unjust with me cut down by their failure. I have lived to see every one of them reduced to failure far beyond anything that they planned against me. At every turn of the road which had led finally to my rainbow's end, I saw indisputable evidence to back the golden rule philosophy which I am now sending forth through organized effort to hundreds of thousands of people. Lastly, I have learned to listen for the ringing of the bell which guides me when I come to the crossroads of doubt and hesitancy. I have learned to tap a heretofore unknown source from which I can get my promptings when I wish to know which way to turn and what to do, and these promptings have never led me in the wrong direction. As I finish, I see on the walls of my study the portraits of great men whose lives I have tried to emulate. Among them is that immortal Abraham Lincoln, from whose rugged, care-worn face I seem to see a smile emerging, and from whose lips I can all but hear the magic words, with charity to all and malice toward none. And deep down in my heart, I hear that mysterious bell ringing, and bellowing it comes once more as I close these lines, and the greatest message that ever reached my consciousness comes, stand with God within the shadow of every failure. Thank you.